Today we're going to talk about uh, viruses making RNA, RNA synthesis. And um, just to give you a little perspective of how this developed historically, uh, remember uh, tobacco mosaic virus, the first virus to be discovered, uh, was crystallized in 1935. <clears throat> a year later, the crystals were found to have 5% RNA in them. And it wasn't until 44, the DNA was found to be genetic material. The Hershey Chase experiment showing that viral DNA is the genetic material structure of DNA in 1953, which happens to be the year I was born. So that's why I'm a scientist, because <laughs> DNA structure was solved that year. 1956, uh, tobacco mosaic virus nucleic acid, the RNA was shown to be infectious. So that's the first time RNA was shown to be a genetic material. Uh, by 1959, RNA was found in many animal viruses. So this is a plant virus, and people say, so what? It's a plant virus. The real viruses, what about them? So they joined the group. And finally, in the 1960s, began, people really began studying viral RNA replication. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, an obvious thing that has to occur during RNA synthesis, or at least replication, is that the RNA has to be copied from end to end. You can't lose any sequence. Every time you copy an RNA, you have to make sure you get the whole thing. All right. Now, we will talk about this a little bit, how this happens. But in some cases, viral RNAs are made that are shorter. And we'll talk about that. But those aren't replication <coughs> steps. Those are just mRNA synthesis. So the other thing that has to happen in cells infected with RNA viruses, you have to make mRNAs that have to be translated. And sometimes these two are the same. Sometimes the genome is the same as the mRNA, sometimes not. We talked about that a little bit. The viruses we will talk about today are shown in the context of the Baltimore scheme. And we're going to talk about um, <coughs> plus-stranded RNA viruses, negative-stranded RNA viruses, and double-stranded RNA, these three down here. And we're, we're not going to talk about retroviruses today. Even though they have RNA, they get a lecture to themselves because they're pretty neat. All right, terminology so you understand what, what we mean when we say something. Sometimes we'll say replicase, which is an enzyme that copies RNA to produce genomes. So replicase doesn't make mRNA, although technically for some viruses that, where the genome is mRNA, it does. But we, we call them replicases because they copy the genome. A transcriptase is an enzyme that produces mRNA. A transcription is the process of copying DNA into RNA, which we'll talk about in two lectures. And finally, a promoter is a sequence that controls transcription of DNA templates. So these two, uh, these last two named uh, term, terms we really don't use when we talk about RNA viruses, but it's one of those things that people misuse all the time, like transfection and uh, other things that I've told you. But uh, just so that you know, these apply to DNA viruses. All right, so the beginning of this whole field really began with this experiment um, in the late 50s, early 60s. And what was done here was to infect cells with a virus related to polio. It happened to be mango virus. Actually, this is polio virus here. The first one was done with mango, but here's, I'm using polio as an example. You infect cells. And then uh, at different times after infection, uh, you make uh, an extract from the cells. So you break the cells open and you make an extract. Get rid of the nuclei, so you don't want those. Uh, and then you add a radioactive precursor. And you, you add one of the four triphosphates, which has an, uh, an isotopic label, so you can measure it. Uh, and then you uh, measure the uh, incorporation of this label into RNA, basically, which is shown here. And, and these are the solid lines. So you can see at about between two and three hours post-infection, you get a steep rise in the amount of RNA made. It peaks here at about four to five hours and then goes back down. And these are the PFU made at the same time. You can see the RNA synthesis parallels uh, viral, infectious viral production. So this was the first hint that cells, infected cells made RNA. And for many years, people didn't understand what was doing this. What was the enzyme doing this? Some people thought it was a cellular enzyme, uh, but uh, and it, it turned out to be a virus enzyme. So this is how RNA polymerases were identified. So that's an assay that I just showed you, cell extracts incubated with NTPs. Uh, they also found that the RNA synthesis that I showed you on the previous slide is resistant to actinomycin D. Now, actinomycin D is a drug that prevents 
RNA synthesis from DNA templates. So people thought maybe this RNA synthesis that we see in virus-infected cells, maybe that's a, um, a reflection of the RNA being converted to DNA and then back to RNA. This is actually what people were thinking back then. But the fact that this RNA synthesis that I've just shown you was actinomycin D resistant showed that it was not cellular and it was virus specific. Uh, eventually, people figured out that if the virus had a minus strand genome, then the polymerase would probably be in the particle. Right? Remember, because the minus strand, when it gets into the cell, it can't be translated. It would have to be copied. So people reasoned there must be a polymerase in there. It looked, they looked for them and they found them. So in the negative strand viruses, I think VSV was one of the first to, to have a polymerase discovered in the particle. And they had an enzyme there that had this activity of making RNA from viral RNA. Uh, more recently, when we have been able to sequence genomes and look at the sequence, we translate the nucleotide sequence into protein, we can actually predict which one is going to be an enzyme. Uh, so there, there are certain sequences. Gliasp, ASP, for example, is one of them. It's a signature of an RNA polymerase. And you can see that in the sequence. And then you can express the protein in cells and show that can copy RNA templates. And now today we have three-dimensional structures of many RNA polymerases, so we can see exactly how they work. And this is important because a lot of drugs can be designed that would inhibit these polymerases. <coughs> now the uh, RNA template, as it is in the virion, um, varies according to the virus. And this is informative because it goes along with what the first step is when viruses infect cells. Typically, negative strand, uh, viruses with negative strand genomes, those RNAs are coated with protein because as soon as they come in the cell, they have to start making RNA. So the proteins include usually a nucleoprotein of some sort, sort of like the nucleoproteins that build those helical capsids, but they also have polymerase enzymes associated with them and some other proteins that are needed as well. So as soon as those RNAs come in, they're ready to start making uh, mRNAs. So they're really not naked RNAs, they're ribonucleoprotein complexes. Now the plus strand genomes are typically naked in the virion. So poliovirus, for example, the, the genome is plus stranded. And the first thing that happens is it gets translated. It doesn't, it doesn't need to bring anything in with it. So the RNA is naked in the capsid. Uh, there are two exceptions. The retrovirus genomes are complexed with proteins. And they're un unusual because the retrovirus genomes, the RNA genomes, get copied back to DNA. And the cell can't do that, so that has to be brought in with the particles. So you have the, the way you can tell that, of course, from the name, retrovirus, you can think, well, it's an RNA genome, it's got to go back to DNA. And coronaviruses are also unusual. They are plus-stranded uh, RNA genomes, but they come into the cell complex with proteins. And we're not sure why. This is, you know, there's always an exception. We try and make rules, and then the viruses break them as we discover new ones. But uh, the coronaviruses are really long RNA, so maybe that has something to do with it. Now, the double-stranded RNA genomes, you can probably predict uh, that there has to be a polymerase in the virion. Even though they're double-stranded RNA, and one of the strands is plus-stranded, it can't be accessed by ribosomes because the double strands is, makes it inaccessible. Ribosomes can't melt uh, the double strands, so they can't translate it. So these double-stranded RNA viruses, they bring the polymerase uh, into the cell with them. So here's an example of one of these negative strand RNA genomes coated with protein. We've actually seen this before when we were talking about nucleocapsids and helical symmetry. Uh, this is the VSV structure shown here. This is the helical uh, genome of VSV. And to complete the particle, remember, it would be surrounded by an envelope. Uh, and this protein subunit, the nucleocapsid protein, uh, binds the RNA. And here it is binding to a short stretch of RNA. And here are a number of them uh, binding to a longer piece of RNA. So this is what I mean that the RNA comes into the cell a complex with protein. In addition to this nucleocapsid, it also brings in the polymerase with it and a few other proteins that's needed to make uh, RNA. So RNA can be naked or it can be complexed in the virion. And the other property of RNA that's important to remember is that it can have secondary structures. So RNA is not just a linear molecule. 
stretched out in the virion. It's all coiled up. And in addition, it has uh, these so-called stem loop structures. And these are formed by base pairing. So here in green is an RNA molecule. And wherever there's a red bar, that means that the opposite parts of the sequence are base pairing. And it forms a stem and then a loop. So eventually it has to be a loop, uh, form a loop so it can turn. You can't be base paired all the way. And you can get some very interesting complicated structures. You can get uh, hairpin loops, bulge loops on the sides like this, multi-branched loops. You can get multiple stem loops and so forth. And these have a variety of functions in uh, RNA replication. They're recognition sites for proteins. They can be termination sites. And we'll encounter these as we move along. I want you to know uh, what we're talking about. Another kind of <clears throat> structure, which is really a secondary structure, uh, with, uh, which is rather complex, is called a pseudonaut. And that's shown on the right here. Now in a pseudonaut, you have a stem loop structure, shown here. And then some bases in the loop base pair with sequences downstream. <coughs> all right? So this is base pairing with this linear portion of the RNA. Uh, it, what it does is form something like this. It's really two adjacent uh, stems, if you will. Uh, and it forms this structure shown in panel C. So that's a pseudonaut. So it looks like a knot, but it's not actually, you don't actually, the RNA doesn't actually go within a, a loop, uh, but it does look like one. And these also have biological functions, as you'll see. <coughs>